Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, some of you may know me. I've been around Window World for 12, 13 years now. And um, one of the things that I'm known for doing is finding out where the bumps in the road are going to be. And this one I've been watching for at least five, six years now. And um, in, as you probably have noticed, especially if you read DWM, we had a big bump in the road uh, about eight weeks ago with the Federal Trade Commission um, having some cases against five window manufacturers, a couple of them extremely prominent. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that means. So when Tara called me, she said, you know, what's going to happen? Can you look into your crystal ball? But here's, since we're talking about government and legal, there's got to be a disclosure here. I'm not a lawyer. I only play one in my mind. Um, this comes directly from some FTC uh, material. Conclusions here, either within what I'm saying or what the FTC has issued, should not be interpreted as a general statement of how the Commission may interpret or take action in the future. Basically, they reserve the right to change their mind. So these are um, gleaned from asking a lot of questions. So take it for what it's worth that this, this crystal ball may actually be more, more like a magic eight ball coming from somebody who reads a lot and then after reading shakes things up and then asks a lot of questions of people in authority tries to pin them down as much as they possibly can be pinned. So what does my magic crystal eight ball tell me? Well the first one is that it's really important to ask the right question. So who should we listen to? Because in the world of green, that's really tough. You know, is there a definition anywhere of what is green? I challenge anybody to find one. Because everybody's an expert, all you gotta do is ask them. Everybody who knows what they think they know about green will tell you they know it beyond any shadow of a doubt. You walk down the street and the next expert you ask will tell you something completely different. And a lot of times, green is whatever somebody's important issue is. When I walked through the Southwest Terminal yesterday, according to one division of the EPA, building green meant building for radon mitigation. That's what their definition of green was. That was a new one to me. Usually, green is the new word for energy. But you also get in with water and recyclables, renewables, social responsibility. You heard about air quality this morning. For a lot of people, green is bringing many issues together. It's not just one thing. They would say that the EPA ad for radon was greenwashing because it's not comprehensive. For others, especially those who really think they know green, it's a green product made by a green company. If you're not environmentally responsible, it doesn't matter how good your product is. So, you know, where, where does everything overlap? Where is that sweet spot? Who is right? Who is the authority? And anybody who deals with building codes knowing that who is right is not necessarily who the authority is. A lot of times the authority <coughs> is arguably not right. So let's get to asking the right question. And part of the reason why I'm including these um, programs up here, there's these logos for people who have a reasonable basis for knowing what green is for their particular area. That's part of the reason why it's so important to hear what Tracy's got to say because he's talking about something made specifically for the window industry. I would tell you that who is right and who is the authority are not the real questions. The real question is who is the authority having jurisdiction? Who is the one could hurt you? That answer is the Federal Trade Commission. And that's usually the last, last group that anybody ever thinks about actually touching them in their little area of the world. But this, I'm going to leave this up for a minute. This is really important to grab. It's also on my website. This is the section that exists today. It has been in play for 25 years. How they choose to enforce it is different. 
and they're enforcing it more. But this is, this is what is in play today. These are not proposed rules. They have the authority. So what does it apply to? This is the truth in advertising uh, section. And it applies to any way you communicate to your customers. And it doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C. We, B2C gets a lot of play, but B2B is also important. It has to do with advertisements, which is what you usually think about advertising. But it, it, it applies to any way you communicate. It can apply to words, symbols, even the name of your product, letters. So what's the, what's the crystal ball tell me next? And this is the crux of everything. You have to connect your products and your actions with your advertising. And when I say advertising, I mean your communication. Say what you did, did what you say, and document it. This is the basis for ISO, if anybody deals with ISO, International Standards Organization. But there's a reason that all of the standards groups, codes groups, that we trust follow this. You know, may, people may not remember why it's important, but it is. And this is where the, there's a cross, cross section between them. So to that end, what does the FTC say you need to, need to do with, with your advertising? The important part when, is, can the consumer evaluate the claim for themselves? And for what we do, the average consumer really can't. We spend hours and hours and hours talking about nuances. So when that happens, there has to be a reasonable basis for the advertising. And that's what we wind up talking about in standards and codes and things along that lines. What are the tests, the studies, and other scientific evidence that lead us to the conclusions? And have they been evaluated by qualified people? Qualified people is a little bit different than the, than the scientific experts because that's where the cross, crossover from business comes in. And finally, is it accurate? And whoever is promoting, marketing the material has to have evidence before the ad is run, before the, the material is, is um, executed about that claim. You can't get it after. You don't have to share it, but you have to have it. Um, and when it comes to when it comes to communicating, any qualifications or disclosures have to be clear. You know, you think about the the um, drug ads these days. You have the touchy-feely uh, message, and then you have this guy talking really, really fast with all the bad stuff that can happen. This is where it comes from. There has to be a distinction between product and package. That's pretty well established. But here's where the action of the last eight weeks really, really comes to play. Any comparative claim should be sufficiently clear to avoid consumer deception and should not overstate the benefit either expressly or by implication. And this is the place that advertisers, the advertising companies that you work with, the, the people that you have in house continually fall down. It's by implication. It's what you don't say that will get you in trouble. This is one of the exhibits, you see right there, complaint exhibit A against one of the companies that was popped eight weeks ago, um, THV Holdings. And the implication here is that the entire bill will be paid within eight years or whatever is left over, they're going to pay. The company is going to pay. The company had 16 caveats on this. But there's no caveat here. The consumer will take a look at it and expect that there's no caveats. And that's problematic. So if there's anything that I leave you with today, it is two basic tenets to, to 
comply with FTC regulations, and that is substantiation and specificity. Be able to substantiate anything you make, and whatever claim you make, um, it has to be specific. If you make a broad claim, you would better have broad proof. Here's another example. This was from Winchester that was included in the documents. There is a lot of specificity here, but it's the wrong kind of specificity because they're talking about their triple A high performance low E special glass. Wow, sounds great. Look at all these different configurations. But what it doesn't say is what it's being compared to. Are you gonna actually hit these numbers if you replace your, your um, Energy Star window of yesterday? Chances are these numbers are coming from single pane clear glass where the majority of it is sitting on the western side. Now the question is, is it coming from Minnesota or Houston? You just don't know. So while the 40, you know, you can save up to 47%, the consumer only sees the 47%. That's the implied part. What's interesting about the cases from five, from eight weeks ago, is that all of them centered around this guarantee. So that, you know, the, the FTC seems to um, investigate one particular aspect and then they will do a search across the industry for who is not complying with that and then grab them in bunches. So when you take a look across the 20 year history of these, these um, um, the history of against the green guides, you'll see clumps with the same problem cases with the same problem. So it's not just about the letter of the law, but it's the spirit and the intent. This is where you're going to get into arguments, potentially, with your lawyers and your advertisers, especially if they have not done the research. Since the guides are under review and update, they only apply to the 1998 topics. They are supposed to, the FTC is supposed to review these every 10 years. They were created in 1992, they were reissued in 1998. The very first hearings uh, and workshops were done in, 19, in um, 2008. There still have not been new guidance officially executed. But the draft came out in September of 2010. So if you look at Section 260, what it says is that um, they address the application of Section 5 to environmental advertising practices. They provide the basis for voluntary compliance. That's where everybody stops reading and that's where they get tripped up. Anybody know who Ogilvy is? Anybody ever heard of Ogilvy? One group. Tracy, anybody else? Think Mad Men. Ogilvy is one of the world leaders for advertising. They created advertising as we know it today, back in the 1960s. And of course, they're on the bleeding edge, cutting edge. And they, when the green industry started, they created a subsection called Ogilvy Earth, and they have a great board of directors who know a lot about green. But apparently, they didn't talk to their lawyers. Because they issued a, a um, booklet for their customers on what to do about green advertising. And this is a quote. The green guides are limited in that they are merely guidelines for voluntary compliance and are not legally enforced. Hmm, bad advice. This came out five weeks ago in response to the action. Thomas Cohn, who is now a partner at LeClaire Ryan in New York, who is the former uh, director of the Northeast region, he was in charge of the Northeast region, said companies would do well to begin adhering to the proposed revisions before the final guidance is issued. Because in this case, guidance is, is a substitute for legal precedence. When a law is passed, 
The only way that you're going to know how a court is going to apply it is based on um, their records. If they don't have any cases that have been found, they, the federal government, in this case, the FTC, issues guidance in lieu of those cases. Because you always hear on law and order, they quote this case, in this case, this, this judge found for this, and in this case, this is um, found for that. It's legal precedent. Well, without it, you know, we've only got 42 cases for this which is a relatively small number. The, the FTC has issued this, this uh, guidance. And this guidance is often found in the complaint against them as evidence. So while it's not the law, it can be used against you if you don't comply. And you can see that in the two case, in the, in the six cases they've done over the past um, 14 months. In the matter of tested green certification and in the matter of Gorel, Long Fence, Sirius Energy, THV Holdings, and Winchester Industries. This is what I think is particularly scary. There's not a company that I know of that when the green hit, somebody sitting around a board table said, well, why don't we make our own logo? Doesn't really matter. Nobody's checking anything. We can do it. It's not that big a deal. Um, that's what Testa Green did. Testa Green, among other things, basically marketed and sold certifications for $1,000 a piece. They never required the company to answer questions. So they took in about $130,000, less than the cost of a house. So a lot of people think, the FTC won't pay attention to anybody who's, unless they're big. It doesn't happen very often. The odds are against me. Or, uh, our, odds are against that we're going to have any action against the FTC. You know, it's a big world. FTC is only one, one group. What is also important here is that the complaint and the, the um, settlement charged that they provided the means and instrumentalities for other companies to commit deceptive advertising practices. So as manufacturers, a lot of times you will provide things to, your, to the fabricator, to the distributor. If you get it wrong, you're held responsible for helping them to be deceptive too. So in this case, with Sirius, um, long, um, Sirius, one of Sirius's clients was also named as one of those five, five um, companies. And again, this is about the spirit, not just the int um, letter. Because if you look, Sirius does qualify the claim down here. They say that, that the 49% may vary based on configuration of the house, location, type of windows. They had proof. But the way it was portrayed was deceptive because the consumer is just going to focus on that 49%. Participation in a program might provide protection. And I say might because it depends on two decisions you make. Does your program adhere to the FTC parameters? Don't go for something that's easy. Because you're part participating in a program because they have taken the guesswork out of it in terms of the substantiation and the scientific um, studies and the evaluation by experts. So make sure that whatever program you participate in meets those criteria. The next part is the what you do. And you have to make sure that whatever information about that certification program is portrayed properly. Gorel, seven years running as the EPA Partner of the Year for Energy Star. They've got a judgment against them because how they used it was deceptive. 
the FTC manager of this unit even said, told the Washington Post, and that's in Tara's article when you take a look at it, make sure you pick it up, there's copies of it outside. They are not making a claim that these are bad windows. These, these are not bad manufacturers. It's what they did with it that got them in trouble. So logos are an easy way to communicate, and everybody wants to slap a logo on it, but they're really easy to screw up. The draft guides equate labels as endorsements. And this is very different from what we think about the window industry from certification. In fact, this was my comment back to the FTC during the comment period in that if you participate in an industry program that you pay for, you're supposed to disclose that you have a material interest in that certification and that it may be misleading in terms of the results. Now, personally, I think that's a travesty because I think, you know, if you slap a good housekeeping seal of approval on something, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was the science that we would get at some place like AMA. But yet, AMA theoretically is somewhat compromised because it's done by members. And that's wrong, I think. Because, you know, AMA goes to great lengths to make sure that it's what we consider to be third party, which means it has three layers of um, oversight. For a lot of the rest of the world, three parties means it's not, you're, I'm buying, you're selling, and somebody else is looking at the transaction as the third party. There's nowhere near the oversight that, that's a different kind of oversight. So be careful of the way that you portray this. This is something that I pulled off of something that showed up on my doorstep for a, um, for a reflective coating product. I can guarantee you that NASA had no clue that this company was using their logo or the Department of Energy and that, they, that neither NASA nor the Department of Energy was endorsing the product. Okay, individuals can be held accountable. More scary stuff. For Tested Green, Jeremy Ryan Clays was also named as a co-defendant. For the next 10 years, he has to report to the Federal Trade Commission where he works. So just because you work for a company doesn't mean you're protected, especially if you're part of management. And it's not just federal. Many states cite the FTC laws. And when FTC decides what cases they're going to bring, they're going to look at regional impact, just like David Crump said. So if you've got a wide regional impact, chances are they're going to take it. If it's a state, then chances are they're going to refer it to the, that attorney general. And I confess, I'm still working my way through to find out which attorney generals are actually looking more closely at truth and advertising for green. I haven't finished that survey yet. Green guides do not address greenwashing. Somebody this morning said, well, you're going to tell us how much, you know, how you're going to get in trouble if, you know, you don't say what you mean or you haven't done it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you have done it and you haven't said it. But there's a lot of, there's plenty of people out there, this is where the authority and this is where the who's right people are going to point fingers at you that you're not really green. And this is another one of my comments to the FTC is that without a definition of green, which the FTC has declined to define, <coughs> companies are at liability for everybody finger pointing. This is a famous case in point again with window manufacturers. This was the uh, 2010 green build. Um, forest Ethics hung a banner accusing um, sustainable forest industries of greenwashing, um, specifically with Sierra Pacific. Sierra Pacific has successfully fended off nine lawsuits in California against their environmental practices, but Forest Ethics is still saying they're doing something wrong because they're not FSC certified as opposed to SFI, which is industry driven. The same day, they took out a full page ad in USA Today and accused 
um, Anderson, Colby and Colby and Geldwin of greenwashing as well because they purchased from Sierra Pacific. Again, I think this is a travesty. I don't think they have any business doing it. Even if they didn't know? Say again? They're still held them accountable? You know, they're, they're purchasing from them. They're, this is purely in the, in the court of public opinion. There is no legal basis for their challenge. Forest Ethics has asked uh, the FTC to take a look at SFI versus FS FSC. That's been going back and forth. But there has been no comment from the FTC. And quite frankly, the FTC will is incapable, not incapable, unable by law to tell you what they're working on. The only way that you're going to know is when the press release comes out or when you're looking at the backside of a lawsuit from them. Anybody that says that they are, you know, that they're working on something is either heard it from the company that they are investigating or they're pulling it out of their hat. <coughs> because the FTC is not allowed to comment on what they're working on by law. They're not able to tell you how many people they've got working. There's a rumor out there that they've doubled their staff of lawyers to look at green claims. They are not allowed to comment on those things. So to wrap up here, these are your takeaways. Say why your product is green and have a reasonable basis. Make it easy for the targeted consumer to come to the right conclusion. You know, sometimes focus groups can be expensive. If you can afford them, do a focus group. Otherwise, send the secretary home to buzz it around their family, take it to Walmart and have a bunch of people look at it on the way in the door to find out. Federal Trade Commission's got some really good uh, market studies available that you could take a look at as well about how consumers are defining some of these words. This is different than, from greenwashing. Greenwashing is still very much a, the Wild West, but when it comes to actual, actual um, keeping your, your, um, your company safe from FTC, make, it's what you define as green. And as long as you define it, where you're advertising in a specific sense, you're going to be okay. And we'll take questions at the end. Just a plug for my Twitter, Arlene on Energy. Morning. Thank you all for uh, joining us here today, and thanks to Tara and to Keith for uh, inviting us. And give you a little update. As uh, Arlene mentioned, some of the work which is going on uh, at AMA right now. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, AMA is the American Architectural Manufacturers Association. It's a consensus group, uh, primarily uh, window manufacturers, both commercial and residential, uh, who write standards and specifications. And AMA has uh, certification programs uh, for air water structural, for thermal, for acoustics, and are now looking at developing a program for the rating and certification of fenestration products to be determined as green. And I do the little air quote things because as obviously you probably gathered from Arlene, Arlene's presentation, green is kind of a arbitrary term and so we're not, it's not going to be called the green certification program it's just for reference right now as it's still under development we've got another group that uh, uh, that we're working on as far as what the name of it will actually be called probably having something more to do with sustainability uh, versus green but just want to give you a quick overview of some of the work which has been doing going on there I assume most of you, everybody's familiar with this guy, and he, he pretty much had it right quite a long time ago. Um, it isn't easy. It's been a lot of work which uh, has been gone through all various iterations over the past several years. Uh, we're almost there, at least with regards to the residential side, but I just wanted to give you an understanding of where things are today and when you might uh, expect to be seeing something within the industry. As far as the history goes, uh, about five, God, four years ago now, um, we had a group uh, sitting in AMA and had some concerns about these various different other organizations in the world that were telling everybody what was green. Uh, LEED and ASHRAE and Green Globes and a number of others that uh, Arlene had in her presentation. Primarily going out there and saying, all right, here's our green program and here's what our sustainable program is going to be and here's all the requirements for it. So here's the, the LEED program and here's what you have to do for LEED. Well, Green Globe said, well, this is our program and here's what you have to do for Green Globes. And then you've got multiple other organizations out there, each creating their own programs. 
primary concern was eventually they were going to get around to Windows. And eventually you're going to have five different programs out there or more, each saying what a green window is. And you can guarantee none of them would agree with each other. So for the fenestration manufacturers, you're going to have to meet every single one of them in order to be able to, be able to sell across the board, but they're all going to be different. So Alma looked at it and said, let's see if we can uh, nip this one in the bud and let's create a program and we'll tell the organ we're the window people we'll tell the world what green is supposed to be when it comes to fenestration and then go out there and have them reference this program say that don't worry about it we got the windows taken care of and here's what it is and here's what it should be just reference this program when you want to talk about fenestration so that's the the motivation behind putting this program together and as i say it's been uh, gone through multiple reviews revisions iterations over the past four years um, it's intended to be performance based uh, and as is most uh, re programs under AMA and several other organizations is versus prescriptive requirements. It says well all green windows have to be green literally uh, versus blue windows. Um, so this is actually based upon performance. What are characteristics and attributes which can be tested and measured which establish some relative comparison between different products. Now, there are certain areas where you can't do that. Uh, so for instance, with recycled content, um, that you, I mean, recycled content is a prescriptive requirement. You either have it or you don't. And then it's a matter of how much you have in it, which establishes your relative level of greenness. So wherever possible, it's intended to be performance-based, but there are some areas where it is, is prescriptive. So it's, it's more pass-fail. And the, as most of the work that AMA does is, is intended to be material neutral. So it doesn't say that a vinyl window is more green than an aluminum window uh, versus a wood window. Uh, the, the requirements are, are irrespective of the, the material from which the, the product is manufactured. And again, it's per, uh, segregated between performance based and then the features based, which are more the, the uh, measurable versus uh, uh, testable. Um, and what you're doing is looking at, all right, there's an entire array of points which are available, very similar to what if those of you might be familiar with LEED. And it's how many points you can get out of the total that are available, which establishes your relative rating within the program uh, for comparison to other programs. So right now the, the program is scheduled on a, a basically from zero to 100 points. And so if you're te comparing one product to another product, a 70 is more green than is a 50. Um, and so that's the, the relative comparison between the, the way products are rated. When we first got started, we figured, well, this is going to be easy. We'll wrap this one up in a, about six months. All we got to do is just agree. Um, as I said, that was four years ago. And uh, we've gone through various iterations. It originally started out as, well, let's just have a green program for all fenestration products. Then we came to realize that there were certain characteristics and attributes which differentiated residential versus commercial products relative to what those groups in, uh, respectively did, thought would be a sustainable product. So we basically have split it out now. So we've got two different programs. We've got one for, uh, uh, and when you see the RLC CWAW, that's uh, is categorized under uh, 101 IS2A 440, which is the, the structural specification. So RNLC is a two different classes of products. They used to be referred to as uh, a residential or like commercial. Uh, and then CWAW would be more from the commercial side, which is commercial and architectural products. So looking at, based upon the definitions of what those products are under the structural specification, determines which, pro which products fall into which programs. And then there's a third one, because obviously the Skylight guys didn't want to get left out, but they didn't want to have to be rated the same way as a window guy. So they're actually broken out into their own third uh, different program. Um, so. <clears throat> Each of them are having very similar uh, attributes, uh, but the requirements for each vary a little bit between the different programs. The RNLC program is the one which has moved forward furthest down the road right now. Uh, we're actually, hopefully, uh, going to be in our last ballot uh, as we speak right now. So that this program should be wrapped up by June of this year. Uh, with the ability uh, through the development of a proce or procedural guide, which is just basically how you certify and rate products, to follow shortly thereafter. So we're hoping that sometime this year we'll be able to roll out the certification program for the, the residential type products. Uh, the commercial products are a little bit further, are a little bit behind, uh, but a lot of the work that they're utilizing has been done by the RNLC program. So they're probably looking to come in sometime middle of next year. And the Skylight guys are just hanging out to see if anything actually happens. And then they'll do whatever is the easiest. So what we want to take a look at is briefly go over what are the requirements within the, and these are not necessarily exclusive of RNLC versus the CWAW. They're all very similar. 
but you've got 10 different performance attributes. Uh, the first one's having to do more with energy efficiency. Uh, then you've got the, the ability to uh, uh, provide ventilation. And then you've got your structural performances, uh, both from uh, the wind, full window system as well as from the insulating glass unit. And then you've got some uh, uh, durability requirements as far as finishes that are applied. How long will those finishes last on a product? The ability to resist condensation uh, of a window system and then the visible transmittance. Now what's key with regards to these is that the ones you see in bold, those are minimum mandatories. So you have to meet the requirements for, uh, at least meet the minimum requirements for those six in order to be considered for certification. The rest of them are all optional. Uh, you don't have to have a operable unit or something with an integral ventilator, but if you do, you get more points. Uh, if you don't have something which meets the requirements, minimum requirements for heating energy efficiency, you're done. You, there's no, no reason even to show up. So those ones are going to be mandatory versus the rest that are basically optional. Then from the feature side, we have four attributes, which again are more around the prescriptive requirements. Uh, versus the, the testable uh, requirements. Those are going to be your recycled content, uh, how much recycled content is in the product as it's being manufactured, how, uh, uh, whether or not there's renewable content within the product. Recycled obviously being something which is taken from previous materials and converted into a new product. Renewable is more from things which have a, a renewable resource such as wood. Uh, the volatility of applied finishes, so any finishes that are get, being applied to the product, do they have volatiles which are being expelled into the environment, into the atmosphere? And then environmental management, and this has uh, specifically to do with uh, ISO 14001, uh, which is do you have a program in place for how do you manage your, your business and production of products relative to its environmental impact? Now all the performance and uh, features are going to have different levels of points and I'll be getting into those in just a minute and again the primary focus here is that it's it's there's a total number that are available how many can you actually your, does your product actually meet in order to be able to determine the relative ranking hope you can see this all right uh, these are the first set of the uh, performance attributes so as you see here we've got uh, uh, heating energy efficiency cooling energy efficiency uh, whether or not the product is operable which is a ventilation characteristic and then relative to that is going to be the, the air tightness of, of the unit. How you doing? Yeah, sure, there's a bug, right? Um, but uh, uh, so as you can see here, um, the, one of the things, mo most recent changes that we've had uh, is with regards to heating energy efficiency and cooling energy efficiency. Uh, there was concern that if they were equally balanced, um, there would be products which were misrepresented, particularly in southern markets, where a significant uh, improvement on U-Factor doesn't necessarily do a lot when you're in Miami. However, a relative improvement in solar heat gain can have a dramatic impact on uh, energy uses. So as you'll see for the, the heating and energy, cooling energy efficiency, we've got it segregated into two separate zones. So for your uh, IECC's, IECC's uh, climate zones three through eight, which is basically your uh, north or your south central and uh, northern markets, uh, you can have for heating energy efficiency, you can have up to 25 points for depending upon your U factor. And now, if you're in the south in climate zones one or two, the maximum you can get, points you can get for U factor is, is going to be 10 points. Compare that to cooling energy efficiency, which is obviously going to be more reflective of a solar heat gain coefficient. So in the north, you can only achieve 15 points maximum relative to solar heat gain, but in the south, in the southern zones, you can get up to 30 points. So that's a, a balancing act, uh, which is trying to address uh, differences as far as market conditions in, in North America. Then your operable product is primarily can you provide ventilation, controlled ventilation uh, to, to a building envelope versus air infiltration, which obviously is uncontrolled extraneous air leakage, which uh, uh, is an energy negative. And then each of them obviously is going to have uh, a different point valuations. And what you see um, on the, the right side, my right, I guess you're right too, um, is going to be the, the segregation of points uh, for each, depending upon the, the characteristics of the product. Hi, Tara. How are you doing? Oh, is that what that meant? Um, <clears throat> no, that's, I missed you too. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, uh, under air infiltration, you've got different requirements uh, which will uh, provide you with different uh, levels of achievable points. Uh, basically saying that if you have a test report that says you meet the, the requirements of 101 IS2, which is for residential products, uh, uh, 0.3 uh, SCFM per square foot, uh, if you've just got a test report that says that, you get two points. 
Now, if you've got a test report that says you're actually at least 33% better than that, so you're at an error infiltration of 0.2, you get four points. Now, if you're if you, get, if you meet the baseline requirements, but you're under a certification program, so it's not just a test report, you're actually under a certification program to ensure the product you're making is actually re respective of the product that was tested, then you can get eight points, and then if you're obviously that higher performance class and you're certified, you get up to 10 points. So that's uh, an example uh, of how the, the points are segregated by, by different uh, performance characteristics. Then you've got the same for water resistance, structural performance, uh, insulating glass durability. Uh, durability of finishes, and I won't get into all the, the requirements here because you probably wouldn't want to know. Uh, condensation resistance and visible transmittance. So each of those having different levels of, of potential performance, uh, each of them having different levels of uh, points which can be achieved for a total system rating. And then onto your, your features, which is your uh, recycled and renewable content, which has actually been combined into one since it's difficult to have a PVC window made from renewable materials, but it's also difficult to have a wood window made from recycled materials. So they've been grouped together because typically they, they tend to offset. Uh, the applied finishes has to do with uh, that volatile content. So whether or not the, the finishes are providing any volatiles to the environment, uh, uh, which obviously would be uh, damaging to the environment. And then environmental management is strictly how do you manage your waste? Uh, how much waste do you produce in your process? And then when, with the, amount of the waste that you do pr uh, produce, what do you do with it? Do you throw it out or do you have some mechanism for getting into a, a recycling program? So in the end, uh, basically what you come down to with is a ratio of how many points you got versus how many points are available. And again, we're at 100 points right now. So if you get 40 points, that's the minimum, that would, is the current proposed minimum uh, uh, for entry level. Uh, as far as getting into the program. Now these may adjust a little bit uh, as we go through some further discussions. But again, we're looking at three different levels of quote unquote greenness uh, or sustainability rating uh, for different products. And it, one of the, we've got another uh, group from the marketing side working on, as you see the, the leaves here, but from the promotional consumer level uh, uh, awareness uh, activities. So make sure that obviously if we just throw a 40 versus a 65, they're gonna say, I don't have no idea what that means. Uh, so a, a mechanism to be able to convey via a label, via uh, an educational program that says, all right, I want you to understand that a, a th two leaves is better than one leaf, and here's why. And here's where you can go get the information which compares the two to be able to show that what, what, are, what impacts the, the rating that uh, any product may achieve. See? Yeah. So between Arlene and I, we're uh, open for probably about two minutes for any questions that you might have about any of the, the green stuff out there. <coughs> is there any plan to uh, factor in transportation? Uh, the window made in Texas would be less fuel, et cetera, than a window made and shipped to Texas from Michigan. Well, as far as uh, a product certification has specifically to do with the product, so it's pro the, the, the manufacturer of the product is the one who, cert who, rate, who puts the label on the product. So that would, in, in order to be able to do that, the manufacturer would have to know where every single window is going to be able to get that variable in there, which would be extremely difficult. And if I could also jump in on that, the big, um, the leads, the green globes, they're revisiting that local material metric. So stay tuned because um, there's, that's been one of those places where there's been a lot of gaming and where the manufacturers that don't meet that are crying out, well, maybe not so much. Yeah, the difference with regards to a product certification versus something like a lead, which is a building certification, is you know where the building is. So you know from where everything's coming to get to that site because you're re-rating that building performance versus a product performance where you would have to know where, where it's going in order to be able to, to have that uh, characteristic. How did you determine the maximum point total for each of those features? Like some of them were eight, some of them were three. Blood, mostly. It was, uh, we went through a lot of, it, it, um, it's a lot of manufacturers from the residential commercial side establishing, and, and actually, uh, if you look at the totals, um, and I guess I'll jump up here. So for instance, on uh, heating and energy uh, efficiency, you can see that they're obviously a substantial portion of the overall rating. Uh, what we tried to do was align 
these attributes as close as we could with other programs such as LEED, such as Green Globe, who have building rating systems, and then try to balance out the, the proportionality of the points relative to here to what they would consider it. So that we're not saying that, well, air infiltration should be 90 points out of 100, and they'll say, well, no, it shouldn't, because actually energy efficiency is more important. And so we try to have some alignment with other programs that are out there. All right, thank you very much.